Well, hi, everyone. I'm back here in Macau, back at home base, ready for On The Run to give you all the news of the week coming up next. Run. Well, hi, everyone. Yes, here I am in Macau. Greetings from back at home base in Macau. I'm here, obviously, for G2E, which is next week, and I've been here for a week or two, and I'll be here for another week or two, and then I'll be on my next run out of Macau all around the Asia-Pacific region. Let's go through the news of the week, and let's start, as we usually do, with Macau. So uh, Wilfred Wong and Al Tengo are to keynote G2E next week. Wilfred Wong, of course, president of uh, Sands China Limited and the subject of the cover of the current issue, uh, the July issue of IAG. And Alejandro Tengo, of course, the chairman and CEO of PADCOR. So Dr. Wong will be... Uh, the keynote speaker on Tuesday morning uh, next week and uh, Chairman Tengo will be the keynote speaker on Thursday morning and of course I will be there and I hope you will be there too if you are in Macau. Uh, another big event to happen during G2E is the industry party brought to you by IAG, organised by IAG but really a co-organised and co-brought to you with uh, no less than eight sponsors uh, Akata Manila is the diamond sponsor. Light and Wonder is the platinum sponsor. And then we have six gold sponsors, um, Angel, Angel Playing Cards, uh, APE here in Macau, Aristocrat, IGT, uh, LT Game, uh, Macau uh, Manufacturing Company, um, and of course, WDTS, Walker Digital Table Systems. So all eight of those companies will be represented there. And I hope I will see, see you at the industry party on Wednesday, July 12 at 6 p.m. from the Vista at MGM Kotai. Wonderful venue. But of course, you must have an orange invitation uh, entry ticket on your phone, which you can only get if you have been invited by IAG or one of the eight sponsors. So make sure you get yourself an invitation. Don't turn up to the party without an invitation because we won't let you in. Uh, okay, what else? Uh, let's start with the news from Macau. So Macau GGR fell a little bit uh, last month. So the month to the end of June, obviously a 30-day month, not a 31-day month. The Macau GGR fell 2.3% month on month to 15.21 billion uh, Patakas. So uh, that is almost 2 million US, 1.8, 1.9, something like that. <clears throat> a very slight fall, 2.3%. So it looks like it's now plateauing at just under 2 billion. Did I say million before? If I said million, I meant billion. Uh, under 2 billion uh, US dollars each month, coming out around 22, a run rate of around 22, 23 billion US per year, which makes uh, Macau once again the, the largest gaming market in the world by far, uh, but not quite as big as it was before in revenue terms, but we all know why the loss of the junket industry. JP Morgan came out last week and or during this week and said that uh, Macau now has ample free cash flow. They said that uh, industry, industry GGR has now grown by 31% uh, in the second quarter uh, over the first quarter, I think that is. Um, headline revenue is now 62% of pre-COVID, with mass now being over 85% of pre-COVID. So mass nearly back to where it was, and VIP at 24% of pre-COVID. Of course, that VIP is predominantly direct VIP now. Um, and they said that every operator, all six Macau operators, even SJM, their words, not mine, so that's pretty damning indictment of how SJM is going, but even SJM is generating ample free cash flow, or should be, and that the EBITDA level is now at about 70% of 2019, which was obviously a great number. 2019 was a very good year. I think it was the second best year ever in Macau. So yeah, we're going well. Macau is coming back. And it's a new, more sustainable Macau with less reliance on VIP and none of those big corporate junkets. JP Morgan also came out with another story that we ran this week saying that Macau um, has got all-time high EBITDA margins. That They expect Q2-23 uh, 
EBITDA to be 1.7 billion US dollars, and that is 47% higher than Q1 for EBITDA. And the um, profitability level, if that number is correct, would be around 73% of 2019 levels, so perfectly acceptable. Um, of course, there are lower costs and therefore higher margins in Macau now. Uh, many of the operators have learned how to save money in various ways. In our June cover story, the interview with Francis Lloyd, that great long format interview, he, he reflected on that and he said, they have learned how to do more with less, which is a good mantra for any business at all. Sticking with Galaxy, um, Raffles at Galaxy Macau, uh, it's been now announced that it will open on the 16th of August with a grand opening in late 2023, whatever that means. Um, this Raffles is highly anticipated. So, and as is the new hotel above the GICC, the Galaxy International Convention Center. And um, I've seen the Andes, they've taken me a tour on that. They've taken me on a tour of that. The rooms are very nice, but it's set up as a mice hotel. But the other hotel from phase three, is uh, Raffles, extremely luxurious, 450 luxury suites, and they have already announced there is a digital canvas between the two towers. So there's a, a glass air bridge that runs between the two towers on every floor, therefore making a sheet, which will be a digital canvas. No doubt there will be electronic signage on that uh, when they open. So that's going to be very, very impressive and highly anticipated. Um, I believe some people are already staying in there, some VIPs as a bit of a simulation, and they're going to be opening some restaurants as well a little bit before the 16th of August for people to try out. So that's a big new thing for Macau, the raffles. Okay, let's move on. Um, MGM uh, have announced uh, a Macau Tennis Masters. That will take place in December, there will be four female, sorry, four male and two female uh, tennis players. It'll be a best of three sets for the men as well as the women. And I think that the players that they're announcing around sort of world number 10 level, uh, sort of world number nine to world number 15, something like that level. So pretty big international names. And of course, this is part of the tourism plus sports, tourism plus culture, tourism plus whatever push that Macau is doing with all this non-gaming stuff. So we're going to see a lot of sport, we're going to see a lot of entertainment, and that's great. That's great for Macau. Uh, also news uh, broken by IAG, in English anyway, uh, this morning, uh, that's Thursday, my time, for you watching, you might be watching this on Friday, uh, the Macau government will be auctioning 36 uh, uh, properties owned by Alvin Chow. Alvin Chow, of course, the former chairman, CEO of Sun City, now serving an 18-year prison sentence uh, in uh, Macau Prison. And uh, he was required, uh, he was ordered to pay around 800 million US dollars to the government in damages and around 270 million to five of the Macau six concessionaires, all the concessionaires uh, except not Melco. And he has got, they've seized uh, 31 car spaces, all valued at around 150,000 US and five commercial properties valued each between somewhere between seven and 22 million US. And all of that comes to 600 million uh, mop. So that is around uh, 75 million US. And that will all be auctioned uh, in September. I think the closing bids uh, bids close on September 11. The auction itself will be on September 12. They'll open the envelopes and away they will go. So enough on Macau, let's head over to the Philippines. So um, Akata Manila saga continues now with 26 Capital. Um, the merger termination is baseless, according to 26 Capital. So a little bit of background on this. So Okada, uh, Manila, uh, Jason Ada's 26 Capital uh, has wanted to merge with um, Okada, Manila, basically. I don't know the exact entities, but that it's going to end up becoming a NASDAQ-listed entity, and it's all fallen apart. And Okada, Manila has now sent a termination notice to 26 Capital, citing various breaches. I'm not sure what those breaches are, but citing various breaches by 26 Capital 
And 26 Capital is trying to force Ricardo Manella to complete the deal. Uh, Ricardo Manella says that 26 Capital is just looking for a windfall. 26 Capital says, no, you have to complete the deal according to the contracts in place and the agreements in place. And it's all going to court, of course. Uh, in Delaware on the 10th of July, there's some litigation. I think I think that litigation might be, I think that's prompted by uh, 26 Capital, that, li that litigation. So, of course, you can follow it all uh, at IAG, 10th of July being 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, being Monday. So that will presumably be in court in Delaware in the US on Monday, and we'll see how that all rolls out. New Star down in uh, Cebu uh, announced this week they have opened the Philippines' largest mice venue or convention centre venue um, outside of Manila. Uh, they say it caters for up to 2,000 guests, has three banquet halls, a lobby, a pre-function foyer, uh, an open area lounge and a bridal lounge, and it's 2,449 square metres, has a six-foot high ceiling, and, uh, you know, that's just another rollout uh, from uh, Newstar as they continue to roll out their very, very nice property down there. So congratulations to them. And uh, I'll be down at Cebu at some time soon, and I'll report from down there and let you know more about what's going on down at Newstar. Still in the Philippines, the Finance Secretary of the Philippines, uh, Benjamin uh, Diokno, came out and said that POGO should be shut down. He said that the POGOs is why the existence of POGOs is why the Philippines is on the grey list of the of the Global Financial Action Task Force. He says that revenue can be replaced, and we don't want POGOs. That's his view. Um, the revenue so far this year, well, we haven't got the figures for this year yet, but we've got the figures for the first eight months of last year, and the government was raking in about ten million US a month revenue from POGOs. Uh, for anyone who's been living under a rock and doesn't know what a POGO is, it's a Philippines offshore gaming operator, pretty much the only licensed uh, kind of online gaming in Asia. Still somewhat problematic. And in the Philippines, there's a big argument going on right now about whether they should continue that industry or not. There's no doubt it has caused a lot of problems, but it's also brought in a lot of revenue for the government. And so there are two schools of thought, should we keep it or should we not keep it? Uh, I think the prevailing school of thought right now is we should keep it, we should clean that industry up. Uh, but the Gatchalian, moving on to the next story, the Gatchalian family is one that certainly doesn't want POGOs. So the Philippines, uh, Valen Valenzuela City in the Philippines has banned POGOs at the city level. Now, the mayor, there's a bit of a family connection here. The mayor of that city is Wes Gatchalian. He's the younger brother of Senator Win Gachalian, who has been getting up in the Philippines Parliament and saying we should get rid of POGOs. Um, one thing he doesn't say is that his father, William Gachalian, uh, owns the uh, waterfront casinos. So there is a casino connection there in the Gachalian family. I'm not criticizing them in any way, shape, or form. They're entitled to their views. Everyone's entitled to their views. So there are these two schools of thought, as I said before, in the Philippines at the moment. And the Gachalians are in the, the school of thought of let's get rid of POGOs, as are many others. But then there are there are others who say, no, let's keep BOGOs and let's clean them up. And that leads me right in, perfect segue to the next story, which is PADCOR raiding a POGO um, in Manila uh, for human trafficking and cryptocurrency scams, they said. Pretty bad stuff. Uh, they've issued a cease and desist uh, to that POGO, so it has to stop all of its activities. The PNP, the Philippines National Police, are now investigating all suspected illegal actions, and they had that POGO under surveillance for a month before they raided it, and they described the raid, Padcourt described the raid as a rescue of 1,534 Filipinos and over a 1,000 foreign nationals from China, Taiwan, a raft of countries around Asia, and yeah, that was a rescue and they had been human trafficked. It was the language that they used. So there's been a lot of this kind of um, action uh, by the police and by PADCOR on these sort of uh, wayward POGOs and even companies that are not POGOs at all, but just do online gaming in the Philippines without, without a license. So I would probably put my school self in the school of I'd rather see the online gaming but see the industry cleaned up it definitely needs to be cleaned up um so you the Philippines doesn't suffer that reputational damage 
Anyway, let's move on now to Singapore. So Maybank uh, came out and said that the mass uh, revenue will pass 2019 levels for Genting Singapore in 2023. Uh, representatives from Maybank had a meeting with the management of Genting Singapore, and they came up with a few conclusions after that meeting. Uh, first of all, the revenue was to pass 2019 levels in 2023. Um, EBITDA is sluggish, so costs are up. Uh, there will be no further pursuit of Japan. Many of you will remember that Genting Singapore was getting quite close to maybe getting a Japan license in Yokohama before that all fell through. And the fourth thing was too early to call for Thailand. Um, many of you will know that Thailand is talking about getting integrated resorts. If they did, would Genting Singapore be a company that would be interested? You would have to say yes. You would have to think yes. Uh, but too early to say, according to the guys at Maybank. Now, Fitch, Fitch ratings uh, came out and said that Genting Malaysia and Genting Singapore are to hit 90% of 2019 revenue this year with a complete recovery in 2024. They also commented quite interestingly that there, there, are, there are high strategic and medium level operational incentives for Genting, Malaysia and Singapore to support Resorts World Las Vegas. And they described the Genting Group globally as now having three flagships, obviously Genting Malaysia, um, which has Resorts World Genting, formerly Genting Highlands, or the area is still called Genting Highlands, about an hour's drive north up the mountain uh, north of uh, Kuala Lumpur. And Genting Singapore, of course, which has Resorts World Sentosa, one of the two companies in the duopoly in Singapore. And now they're describing Resorts World Las Vegas, the $4.3 billion new opening in Las Vegas, which opened a few years ago now and has been not doing so great, to be honest, given how much Vegas is booming and also given the pandemic and all of that. So they came out, the Fitch guys came out and said, look, don't worry about Las Vegas. Um, Singapore and Malaysia will prop it up if they need to. Uh, I know historically that about maybe 60% of all the Gentings Group's global revenue has come from Malaysia and Singapore. Fitch says that by 2024, uh, Vegas will be providing 20% of the EBITDA. I'm not so sure about that, but that's what they say. So let's see if that comes true or not. Now let's go down under to Australia. Um, sports betting ad ban. So this is interesting. There's a big inquiry, uh, Australian government inquiry into sports betting in Australia. And uh, a lot of recommendations came out of it. I think 31, 32 recommendations came out of this inquiry. And one of them was a complete and total ban on any advertising for sports betting to be phased in over a three year period. And um, Jamie Nettleton, one of the most respected gaming lawyers in Australia, uh, uh, spoke exclusively to IAG and his comments were, well, what's the benefit of having a license? The benefit is access to the market. And part of that access to the market and that legitimacy is being able to advertise. And if you can't advertise, uh, it makes it much more difficult. Uh, there's a rising costs uh, environment going on in Australia at the moment with all these recommendations coming out and all of these things being imposed upon Australian operators, it's almost a little bit like a semi-prohibition situation. And as we all know, prohibition doesn't work. So what's going to happen in Australia? I mean, the, the big message out of Australia is gambling is bad. The media says gambling is bad. The government says gambling is bad. The public says gambling is bad. And it's a very simplistic attitude. Um, I think a lot of people would do well to remember what it was like before we had legal licensed gambling in Australia. I do remember that. And there was a lot of much worse stuff going on because if you prohibit something, of course, you push it underground. And that is when criminals get involved. And we don't want that. So let's see how that plays out. Uh, Namura uh, warns that uh, China tourism uh, slowdown uh, is going to affect uh, Genting, they said that uh, China tourism is 25 to 30% of pre-COVID levels. So even though China opened up on the 8th of January, uh, it certainly uh, hasn't seen major outbound international tourism yet. It's still ramping up. It's very early in the ramp up process, and that's affecting everyone uh, around the world who relies on outbound Chinese tourism, including Genting. 
Over to South Korea now. South Korea had a really good June. Um, South Korea casino revenue soar in June. Uh, Paradise. So Paradise has got Incheon. Paradise has got the, the Paradise Integrated Resort at Incheon at the airport. Uh, uh, Seoul Airport, about an hour's drive south of Seoul. Um, they've also got properties in Seoul, Busan, and Jeju, and smaller properties uh, under there. They've got Walker Hill and so forth. Um, their June casino sales was 73 million US, which is very good for them. It's the highest since the pandemic. And the other major company in uh, foreigner uh, company, foreigner facing uh, casino company in Korea is GKL, Grand Korea Leisure, that runs the Seven Luck brand. And they have casinos in Seoul, three Seven Luck casinos in Seoul and Busan. Busan, of course, down in the south of Korea. And their revenues were up 17% month on month, 21% year on year to 23 million in, in June. So between those two companies, around 100 million uh, in June, much, much better for them. And 100 million means a run rate of what, 1.2 billion a year just between those two companies. And they're not the only casino companies in Korea by a long shot. Of course, there's Kanko on land, but that's a story for another day. <clears throat> Now, Jeju, Jeju Dream Tower, their June sales fell to 7.9 million, down 10% month on month, but up 70% year on year. Very much a tables destination, 90% tables, 10% slots. Uh, so let's call it 8 million between friends. So they're running at about 100 million a year, and they're by far the biggest in Jeju, uh, which of course is an island of Korea where Chinese can go and without a visa. Saipan, uh, interesting story this uh, this uh, week about Saipan. Uh, the Saipan regulator has been trying to revoke IPI's license. So people have been probably who have been reading IAG be following this for years. So IPI Imperial Pacific, uh, they they got a license in Saipan. Taipan, of course, part of the CNMI, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. And uh, it's been very, very problematic. The casino did not open. Its it, construction has been halted. They blame the pandemic, but it was more than just the pandemic. Their temporary casino was open, um, but it did not. There was no full opening of the main casino, and it's kind of all fallen apart financially. And the Saipan regulator, the Commonwealth Casino Commission, the CCC, has wanted to shut down or to revoke the IPI license. IPI owes a lot of money to the CCC in fees and so forth. And that also owes a lot of money to subcontractors and various vendors around Saipan. The US District Court had prevented them from revoking, prevented the CCC from, from revoking IPI's license, but they have appealed it and they appealed it to the US Court of Appeals because, of course, Saipan is part of the US. The CNMI is a, can't remember what they call it. It's not a state, obviously, uh, but it's part of the US. It's a ter US territory. Uh, and they've granted that appeal. So now the regulator can go ahead and try to revoke, continue the action of revoking that license. And if they do revoke that license, well, then they can issue that license to another company. And who knows, there's also a push in Saipan as well to have multiple licenses. So let's see what happens in Saipan. Okay, well, that's all the news for the, the week so far. A little bit on events and upcoming, of course, we've got next week is G2E Asia Week in Macau. We had G2E Asia Week in Singapore only about six weeks ago. I know, I know. Um, but anyway, it's G2E Asia Week in Macau next week. So we've got um, the Iaga cocktail reception at Il Teatro uh, at Wynn Macau on Macau side, uh, not Wynn Palace. Uh, on Tuesday evening, we've got the industry party, our party, IAG's party with those eight sponsors uh, on the Wednesday evening. Let me name them again, Akata Manila, Light and Wonder, APE, Angel, Aristocrat, uh, IGT, LT Game, and WDTS Walker Digital. So thank you to all those sponsors for supporting that big event uh, on uh, the Wednesday evening, Wednesday, July 12, at MGM Kotai at the Vista from 6 p.m., but you must have a digital entry ticket on your phone, which you can only get by being invited by one of the eight sponsors or IAG. Hope to see you there. I will be in Macau um, all of the G2E week, then a little bit beyond, probably around July 18, 19, 20. I'm going to go and hit the road again and be on their run again. See you next week for G2E. Have a great weekend and bye for now. See ya.
Run.